Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. We're going to uh, give it another minute here while people are getting themselves in to the room here. But um, yeah, we have a, I mean, a great topic here today. Just uh, going over again, cybersecurity awareness. And we just go over some of the basics and intermediate concepts and things that we have to keep reminding ourselves of when it comes to cybersecurity and helping ourselves and our businesses uh, stay safe. So I think that should be about enough time. So let's get going. So I am joined today uh, by my colleagues, if I can get my, there we go, Tyler Sanders and Rishwan Syed. Say hello, Morning, guys. Everyone. Hey, everyone. Awesome. So we got some great content for you guys today. Um, but super quick, I think a lot of people on the call here probably know who we are, know who, uh, who Pace is. But for those who don't, you know, we're in business now, coming up 24 years. Um, we're a managed IT company. But we do things. We have a, a specific process and structure that we use to managing environments, a very proactive style. Uh, we offer managed IT security, managed cloud services. We're about 65 people in the business now. We're an ISO 9001 business, you know, born and bred on process, procedure, quality, quality improvement. We've been a great place to work for the last eight years, and we're working with a little over 140 businesses managing their IT. So, hey, if we haven't had a conversation in a while or if we've never had a conversation, uh, we'd love to, to talk to you about your business and your IT and, and see if there's any ways that we might be able to help. Um, we do a lot of these free training webinars. So uh, if this is your first time here, welcome. If you've been here before, you know that you can always go to our website, pacetechnical.com under the media dropdown and get access to any of our other free uh, previously recorded webinars. Um, just go ahead and click on it. There's lots of good topics in there. A lot of cyber topics, even Microsoft applications, things like that. So this is going to be our agenda today, just kind of reviewing what the threat landscape looks like, types of threats that are out there, going through some basic cyber terms, maybe some best practices, talking through some of the scams that we're seeing, and then, you know, giving you some safety tips and we'll wind everything up with a little Q&A. Just so really quick, some housekeeping. Um, this webinar is being recorded. That's the question we always get. And we will be sending out a link to all attendees to, to get access to the recording. Again, you could also go to our website. You can ask questions, and we do encourage you asking questions. Use the Q&A window. You can also uh, use the chat window as well. And we're hoping to leave about 15 minutes uh, at the end for questions. Hopefully, we can get through, but we have a lot of con content to get through here. Let's see if I can remember how to do. So we want to do just our super quick uh, poll question. If I could find, um, yes, there we are. <laughs> I had to look for it again. I'm going to launch this poll question. So does your business mandate uh, you and your colleagues to do any sort of regular cyber training? So if you can go ahead and just uh, click, we'll just give a quick minute here to see just to sort of get an idea of uh you know kind of what's out there and in the instance of time we're just going to give it a couple more seconds but we probably have a pretty good uh sampling of our audience here right now and it's seemingly yeah Somewhat, I'm just going to end it right here. So, um, and I'm going to share the results. So it looks like the majority are doing some uh, kind of training, but maybe not on a consistent or regular basis. And then another portion not really doing any, and then a very small portion that yes, they are mandating it. So, hey, but look, we're all here right now. We're going to get some training in today, but. If you are the person responsible for IT in your organization, 
this is one consideration that I would strongly urge and most um, cyber insurance requirement uh, will require you to have some sort of regular con consistent training and testing of your people in place. So strongly encourage that. If you need help with that, again, you could just reach out to us. But let's get moving here because we have a ton to get through. Just super, I mean, everybody, I think at this point knows what cybercrime is, really any kind of criminal activity carried out using computers, the internet. I just still gasp at this number, 600 billion lost to cybercrime each year. That's both in money extorted as well as the cost to businesses. Most of these are still financially motivated. Cybercrime is a service you don't even need to know how to uh, create phishing campaigns or execute them. There's people that will do all that for you. You just pay a fee. It's crazy. Um, such a rapidly growing industry. Really, uh, that's also a crazy stat. On track to surpass the illegal drug trade in the next few years. And this is another scary stat is that you know, it could take you over six months to notice that somebody's actually even breached your system because that's kind of the stealth mode that hackers are in these days, getting in, getting as much intel and information before they come in and, and do the big payload and ask for that big dollar amount. So why are we here? I like to show this because Robert Mueller, you know, former director of the FBI said this like a long, long time ago, even before you know, cybercrime is on everybody's mind right now and cybersecurity, but this was even kind of at the forefront of it. And he predicted this. There's only two types of companies, those that have been hacked and those that will be. So that's why we do these kind of trainings is because we need to keep everything top of mind. The biggest target is social engineering and trying to trick people into getting their credentials and then using that information and those credentials to go in and do more damage. So that's why we do this cyber training. That's why we 100% feel every business should be mandating this because now we have to expect that we are going to be targeted. Hey, and we also have to even prepare for the fact that we are probably going to be hacked at some point and how prepared are we going to be? What systems and process are we going to have in place? Because as sad as it is, you know, the internet is a great thing, but a large portion of the internet exists just to try and sell things to you, to steal from you, manipulate you, and even manipulate your opinion. Uh, but really what they're after, your data and your authentication, because this is the gateway and this is what helps them to you know, get that kind of a value to go and extort a business, do damage, you know, whatever their intent is, trying to get your data, hold your data hostage for a ransom. Your authentication leads them to you know, getting to your colleagues um, and and whatever other kind of a hit they're going to make on you. So look, we're constantly, uh, I'm no different as well. Everybody, if you're connected to the internet, you have an email account, you're getting hit with bait. So we have to learn to recognize it. What does it look like? What are the triggers? And hopefully people don't get fooled. Now, the one thing about these criminal organizations and even government-backed criminal organizations is that they uh, are very, very organized. Um, I did some research years ago and came across a company. It was a case study of a company in the Ukraine. They had like 200 employees. It looked like a regular business from the outside. 200 employees. They had an HR department. They had birthday parties, Christmas parties, you had sick days, vacation days, company benefits. The only difference between their business and our business is they were a criminal organization <laughs> just trying to extort people um, out of their money. Uh, so they are very, very organized and constantly seem to be one step ahead of us and the experts. So um, that's why this kind of training, again, and awareness is so important. What do they have to gain? Top thing is money. Maybe it's fame. Maybe it's disruption with these government backed organizations could also be political as well. But let's have a quick look at at the landscape. Um, just a, a few basic stats. You know, 74 percent of these breaches had some sort of a human element, some sort of social engineering. 
again, just another reason why this kind of awareness training is so critical, because if we are the linchpin, if it is that human error, that is the, the, the biggest potential threat, this is the one, the one way or one of a few ways that we can work to try and help uh, prevent those things. 83% uh, of breaches coming from external actors, you know, the, obviously the, uh, Opposite of that, then, you know, potentially internal people leading and leaking out information potentially. But the big number here, 95% of these things are financially motivated. 50% uh, business email compromise has almost doubled last year. So business email compromise, somebody compromising an email account and then acting as a you know, a certain employee, everything looks very legitimate because it is coming from a legitimate email account, but it has just been sort of taken over by someone. Um, and then these three things, really the credentials that they're after, you know, phishing is still the primary way that attackers are, are getting in and exploitation, any kind of social engineering, showing people shiny objects, trying to get them to click on things. And then one other sort of trend that we're seeing as well, and I thought this number was like crazy, the Internet of Things, which is basically any kind of device that is, a, you know, connected to the Internet. It could be, you know, a printer could be connected to the Internet, uh, your refrigerator in your home, your TV, all things, if you have a smart TV, all connected to the Internet. 1.5 billion in the first half of 2022, there was 1.5 billion breaches on these kind of devices. So just trying to give you an idea of, you know, what it, what is actually going on out there and why it's so important that we need this training. Hire a hacker for right now, anybody on this call, if you wanted to, you could hire somebody to, to go in and do all kinds of damage. Don't tell my kids, but you can actually hire people to go in and hack the education system and change their grades. Ransomware as a service is still a thing, just like going to Amazon and you know throwing some things in your cart. You can throw a phishing uh, campaign in your cart that gives you everything you need, the website, all the templated emails that you need to send out. And all you need, you need to do is just click the execute button and it does everything for you. That's how easy it is for these people. And that's why we're seeing everything so rampant. All these phishing attacks are so rampant because the barrier to entry to be a hacker is really low. Anybody can do it. I'm not suggesting that everybody on this call do it. Please don't. Uh, there's enough out there already. So just talking through some of the kind of recent threats that we've seen, man in the middle attacks are still uh, a thing. Um, so if you don't know what man in the middle, that's basically uh, an attacker tricking somebody to go to a fictitious site. Um, or, you know, uh, if you are on public Wi-Fi, somebody actually getting access to seeing your keystrokes and seeing what information is passing between you and whatever the intended website or end connection that you are communicating with. That's why when you hear, hey, you shouldn't use public Wi-Fi, or if you do, you have to be super careful about what you do because uh, you could be subject to one of these. But another uh, more modern type of man in the middle attack tricks somebody into uh, logging into a fictitious site. And the most common one that we see is like a Microsoft site because everybody's familiar with the Microsoft login. Um, but if somebody sends you a link and sends you to a fictitious Microsoft site that looks like the Microsoft login, they're trying to trick you into putting in your credentials. At that same moment, the hacker is opening up the real Microsoft site and using the credentials that he's seeing you log in with and then logging into the Microsoft site, which will then send you a multi-factor authentication code. You're like, hell, he'll never get this code unless you are on a fictitious site entering that code in for the hacker. So again, super you have to be so careful about what sites that we're on and make sure that if we are on a site and we're entering in credentials, you have to look at the address bar and make sure it is the actual intended site uh, that we're working with. Microsoft Teams has been a, a big target, really everything with Microsoft 365. Um, 
we've seen fictitious things of you know getting an email of from somebody saying uh hey it's your colleague i just posted this file you need to look at um the newer attacks now are coming in where uh hackers are are, are doing campaigns where they're sending teams chat messages so all depending on how your administrator has set up your Microsoft Teams, if you allow any external people to be able to participate, if you share files or things like that, or share certain parts of Teams with external uh, people, then it's possible for an external, if you have this setting open, an external person can come in and send chat messages to your people. And that might fool somebody. What they're trying to do is fool somebody into opening up like a document, let's say um, uh, a SharePoint document saying, hey, um, there's a new HR document that you need to look at and sign. And they're going to try and get you to click on it, which is now going to download some kind of a payload onto your machine, which is not good. Um, so probably most people on this call are not the administrators of their Microsoft Teams, but it's just one important thing to make sure that somebody is actually looking and reviewing proactively your settings within Microsoft Teams. Social media, I'm just showing uh, 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 WhatsApp as one, but it could be WhatsApp, it could be Facebook or whatnot, constantly being uh, targeted because it's so easy for somebody to come in and just start random chats with people. Yesterday, I was just telling somebody, I, you know, I'm on WhatsApp for a few groups, but somebody auto added me to some particular group and they were trying to, you know, get me, it was this long conversation. So it looked like it was almost legitimate and it was some sort of financial group and they were trying to get me to engage and click on things and, uh, you know, to somebody that was unsuspecting or maybe had an interest in whatever topic it was, could have got fooled by something like that. So absolutely stay vigilant. If it's somebody you don't know or don't recognize, delete whatever it is. So AI is another kind of trend that we're seeing. Uh, I mean, we're all hearing about AI and chat GPT and how cool those tools are. Uh, but hey, guess who else realized how cool those tools are? So we're now seeing AI-assisted hacking. So, you know, gone are the days where you used to get these emails, you know, by somebody from a foreign country where English wasn't their first language and you could notice some things and you'd say, oh boy, uh, this looks suspicious. Whereas now they're using AI to write these emails, very convincing ones as well. Not only does it correct their grammar, but they can ask AI to write them something that's convincing that's going to trick someone. Uh, AI can help them generate their code for their malicious sites. Even AI can be taught to listen and learn keystrokes from a recording and utilize that. It's a crazy concept to guess somebody's password. Um, now, the other side of it is it can be used for good, and a lot of cyber tools do use AI and machine learning to try and recognize if somebody is like hacked their system or whatnot. So there is a good side to it, but hackers are using it for the bad side too, just something to be aware of. And this number is also concerning. 95 is the average number of days that a hacker spends just sort of moving around before they launch their attacks. You know, long gone are the days of the, you know, wham, bam, you know, pay me now, a uh, big red alert that showed up on your screen. They don't do that anymore. They're lurking around. They're trying to get as much access and leverage as they can to get the biggest potential payout that they can. So they're stealing your data to either use against you. We've seen instances where they're using it against your clients and emailing if they get your uh, contact list and sending an email out to all everyone in your contact list saying, hey, I just uh, hijacked Joe's computer and I have sensitive information. Some of it is probably yours. Um, and then the biggest one, you know, public shaming, you know, threatening to put sensitive data on a public website um, and asking you to pay money before they do that. So let's look at some cyber turns. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Cy uh, to Tyler and let just him before take that, you through uh, some of these. Um, just wanted to comment on the slide before uh, the last part's public shaming. 
Yeah. Um, like one thing that uh, a trend that has changed, uh, specifically uh, end of 2022 and 2023, uh, obviously recession has a big part to play in that, is that the threats are becoming more and more like an actual organized crime threat. Yeah. Uh, earlier, um, people's experience with uh, malware and ransomware has always been, you know, there's a call center you call into. They're probably the politest, I mean, that you can talk yeah. to. I mean, it's a much better experience than talking to Rogers or Telus, just talking to those uh, call centers for a hacker. Now that trend has changed. Now they are threatening you. Now they are extorting you. Now they are putting the fear of God into you. So that's a trend that we've seen from the end of 2022 to 2023. Yeah, uh, that's definitely a good point. Okay, well then let's move on then to cyber terms. Tyler, we'll let you kind of yeah, take it over. Thanks, Mike. And uh, I'm sure most of you have heard some of these terms and some of these have been around for a long time, but I'll just do a quick recap of them in case uh, we need to refresh your memory or, or teach you something about some of these specific terms that you may hear in the newspapers or just uh, in, in common uh, ways to, uh, to protect yourself from cyber threats. Phishing, we've talked a lot about already. And this is a pretty broad term, but it's ultimately, you know, it's a wide range of scams when someone's impersonating themselves as a trustworthy entity in an attempt to attain information. Um, an example can be uh, you receive an email from Google asking you to click a link and uh, to log in and get ultimately trying to fish to get your credentials. So they're asking you to you've got to reset your password. Please click here to update it. Um, even worse when they're trying to fish for credit card information that uh, you've you've got some some late payment. We're going to suspend your account and uh, please put this credit card information in to get current. Uh, so again, there's a lot wide range of phishing variants. There's spear phishing. So spear phishing is very targeted. That's going after uh, very specific people. And there's usually some social engineering behind that. Same thing with whaling. That's the CEO fraud. So uh, really understanding you know, who the who the key person they're going after is, some of the backgrounds, really some intel on you know, that attack. Uh, smish, smishing and vishing. Uh, Mike talked a little bit about this with the WhatsApp concept. And so this is where you may get a, a text message on your phone uh, alerting you that, you know, CRA has uh, given you a, a, a tax rebate and click here to, to receive it, to redeem it, uh, or conversely calling you up on the phones, usually some urgency behind these things, trying to get you to respond to some sort of urgent issue and uh, ultimately trying to get more uh, credit card information or some information that they can leverage you. Uh, baiting is, is where they're trying to get you to go somewhere um, by baiting you into uh, redeeming. Maybe it's, it's redeeming a, a gift, a prize, something like that. And watering hole attacks is, is usually when they're trying to uh, they know that there's a common site that your organization may go to on a regular basis and they'll infect that site to inadvertently be able to infect the uh, computers in your environment and gain access to them. Uh, malware, this is probably one of the more common terms also. So that's uh, there's many different variants of malware, but essentially it's a malicious code designed to harm computers and systems. Uh, many types of malware programs, uh, it's different goals to steal, delete your user information, uh, steal computing capacities, uh, to spy or destroy a program. Um, so very common, and that's there's all of these different iterations that we've seen over the years of anti-malware types of solutions to defend against the various types of malware out there. Uh, ransomware, it's still prevalent, uh, you know, over the last, let's say, five to 10 years, this has been one of the most common ways for uh, hackers to be able to gain uh, financial reward for uh, encrypting uh, files in the environment. So normally this is some sort of executable that people click on that gets into the environment and encrypts the files. And then you are prompted saying, hey, if you want to gain access to your files, you need to call this number, uh, Bit tra Bitcoin transfers and things like that. Spyware, uh, exactly sort of like the term describes it. It's it's where they're able to get into the computer uh, and then they're watching and they're just ultimately recording keystrokes and uh, being able to uh, see what you're doing on the computer and collect that information to, uh, to plot an attack. Trojan is a uh, form of a malicious code. It looks like a legitimate file program or application, but it's actually designed to control the user's computer and data. 
usually it's hard to detect until the damages and losses are significant. It can delete, spy, and ask for money for seemingly rightful reasons. Uh, virus, uh, it's, it's a type of malware. It's yeah. aimed to infect and harm a file, a system, or a network. Uh, a worm, it's a type of self-replicating malware that when infected on a computer, it's aimed to spread across the, the network to infect others. So this is really how something spawns throughout a corporate network and spreads throughout. Um, two different types of hackers, the white hackers. So these are cybersecurity experts who test a system by running mock system attacks to discover potential security vulnerabilities. These are the good guys that are, you know, penetration testing, all of those types of things to find out, you know, if there's ways for hackers to get into your environment. Uh, then there's the black hat, black hat hackers, and that's a person who tries to break into the computer system by exploiting cybersecurity vulnerabilities. Uh, social engineering, there's a lot of this behind a lot of the different scams out there. So they're researching, you know, uh, people through social media, researching on the websites. Uh, it's always good advice to be cautious how much, you know, exposure you have socially on websites through social media. Uh, but this is, you know, they'll spend a lot of time gathering information, you know, if, if even if you're, you know, personally, they're watching personal social media accounts, seeing you're going on vacation, things like that, they can leverage that in ways to uh, plot an attack, maybe um, knowing that you're going to be out of town and need to initiate a wire transfer saying, hey, you know, going to the finance person, I know, you, I know you're out of town now, but we need to do this wire transfer really quickly. Um, can I go ahead and do it? So it's ultimately just ways to plot very calculated attacks. Yeah. Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you, Ty. All right, so we're going to move on and, and just get started uh, looking at some things here, uh, starting with password best practices. So can anybody guess what might be the top 12? <laughs> You'll see why I made it 12 passwords used in Canada in 2023. Uh, so in the instance of time, all right, uh, time is up. I'm just going to show you. So still, sadly, one, two, three, four, five, six is still the number one password followed closely behind by the word password. It's uh, it's crazy still in this day and age that people are using these basic uh, passwords. So you can see them on there. Uh, you can see why I did 12 because hockey. So, you know, if you're trying to hack a mail in Canada, you know, it's probably a, a pretty good chance if you <laughs> try the word hockey. And see if uh, see if it works. But anyways, Rishwan, I know uh, yes. you had some things about you know how easy it is to hack some of these passwords and some general guidelines. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so what you see on your screen is a, a stat of a brute force attack. Basically, what a brute force attack is is trying every single combination uh, to guess the password. So a one letter password all. A, B, C, D to Z, one, two, three, four, five, all the way from one to zero and all the special symbols. And then adding it two digits, doing the same thing, trying that combination uh, again and again. So basically this is a normal gaming computer. You can go into be Best Buy, get it with one GPU or two GPUs and run this attack. So it's just trying every single password. And as you can see on the screen, uh, even a eight character password, which is was the standard that Microsoft set out several years ago, uh, eight character minimum. It takes that uh, desktop computer that you can buy from uh, Best Buy five minutes to crack it. Doesn't matter what kind of special characters you have, in five minutes it'll have everything. Versus if you go down to uh, a 14 character password that only has uppercase and lowercase uh, letters, like no numbers, no special characters, and it takes them 17,000 years to, scan, uh, to break quite that. quite a gap. Right? <laughs> it, it is absolutely a gap. And what it, what it really demonstrates is length matters. Mm -hmm. So going for a very long 14-character password, it, it's, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, it's always good to move away even from the word password. Stop thinking of it as a password. Think of it as a passphrase. Mm -hmm. what, something that's meaningful to you that is a sentence. Put that as a passphrase and tr start using that, right? Mm -hmm. Just going on, changing your password, adding on the word January, February, March, April, May to it does not help. The hackers know that trick. Yeah. Instead of in brute forcing every single combination, they're just going to keep adding those words because 
people do that. They know that. So do something that's many meaningful to you. Uh, use the, still continue to use the combinations of uh, letters, numbers, and symbols. Fourteen characters. The reason why I gave the example is that's that's what it should be uh, in this day and age. Next year, if we have this conversation, it could be sixteen. It could be hundred. Uh, I know for a fact that Microsoft, Google, and Apple have all gone together and are trying to work on a model that completely gets, is it's just doing away with passwords. So in a couple of years, we may not have passwords anymore. So it might be something we tell our grandkids That would about. be nice. Yes. Uh, and don't use common information. I mean, this is a good one. We face, uh, post so much about ourselves on social media this day and age. It's very easy for people to find this information. So if you don't put it, somebody else will. It's very easy for somebody to go to your uh, son's web page or your wife's Facebook page, for example, even if you're not posting something, oh, on this date, she, you know, there's a picture of you cutting a cake. They know that's your birthday, right? It's, they can scrub through telephone directories, find your, uh, find your phone number. If it is something to do with your company, right? Whatever your company is, if my company, uh, if, if my password contains space technical, Hackers are going to figure that out very quickly. They don't have to go through every single combination. Right. Right. And of course, the easy one, <laughs> it's supposed to be simple, but it's not. Never share your passwords. If you have, if you share a Zoom account or something, uh, it does not mean that you go and share the password with your entire organization. Have a shared password tool. Everybody goes, it's such a complicated password. Nobody can remember it. They always have to go to the tool, copy that password and put it in. And obviously, no sticky notes. It goes without saying. <laughs> but believe it or not, just uh, yesterday, I saw on LinkedIn, uh, somebody on was doing a TV interview mm -hmm. uh, with the passwords written on the back, uh, posted. <laughs> oh, oh, boy. It, it, it could have been uh, the uh, public Wi-Fi password that they did not really think needed to be yeah. hidden. But <laughs> believe me, that company has lost rep. Oh, boy. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Thanks so much, Rishwan. <clears throat> but let's keep moving on and let's look at uh, some email scams. So uh, the most common form that you'll see is spoofing. Spoofing is really easy because these hackers, they don't even have to hack somebody's email account to be able to do this. Spoofing is basically changing header information in the display name to trick you into thinking that it's somebody that you know or uh, somebody legitimate. So some examples like an email coming, it looks like it's coming from a, a friend might contain an, an infected link inside there, or looks like it's coming from your CEO or a colleague at work. Um, and they're asking for sensitive company data, uh, or maybe even something from a vendor or somebody else asking for banking credentials. Those are a few common forms of it. But I wanted to show you a real life spoofing example. Now the names were changed to protect the innocent here, but this is an actual email um, that I just doctored up slightly just so you don't see who it actually came from. But this uh, happened to come to me about a month after I spoke with this, uh, this person about their IT and their IT situation. So uh, it's somebody that I knew and that I had email before. So I'm seeing their name and their email address, which is basically looked legitimate at first glance, but they're sending me a title and purchase agreement, which I wasn't in the midst of buying a house. But this is one of those things that you know could pique the curiosity of someone, whether it's this or somebody randomly sending you financial information. And of course, everybody's curiosity gets up. Oh my gosh, I wonder what's in this sensitive document. I must see it. Well, so or they you, guess right on timing and you happen to be buying a, a house or something, which exactly happens more often well, if they figure something that's relevant to more most commonly across people. Exactly. And that's what spear phishing is all about. Somebody yes, actually watching, or... doing research on you um, and finding this information. But as you can see, this one here, John M. Jones was a legitimate name and j.jones at businesspeople.com was the legitimate email address. So I like this all looks legitimate. But if you look just to the right, you can see another little bracket there because basically what Outlook does is it 
shows you the display name. And then right next to the display name, it shows you whatever email address this just came from. So I was suspicious. So, you know, fully opened up the email. You can see that little thing there. And once you fully open up the email, now I could see the real email this came came from was something like Virgitest 74. Okay, some gobbledygook. All right, so this is definitely not legit. But at first glance, because they basically made the display name their name as in addition to this fictitious email address, that was all just the display name. And then right next to that, because they made it so long, the legitimate email address that it came from isn't in view. So that's one trick that hackers use at first glance. You could easily just double click on the email address, not any attachments, but just the person's email address and open it up. And Outlook will open this up for you and show you the email address of this person. So that's one way that you can test it. Um, another thing, you know, Zoom, whether it's Zoom or Teams now, we've seen these kind of messages come. Hey, you just, you missed a, a Zoom meeting. And who knows, everybody's doing Zoom and Teams meetings. So you might think without looking too closely at, oh my God, yes, I'm supposed to be in a Zoom meeting. And you go and you click on the link right away, not even looking at anything else on there. Um, other things that look like they're coming from an admin team or the IT department or things like that, you have to be very careful of. If you were to click on the link in this one that says protect your email now, you would be brought to this login here, which looks like the legitimate Microsoft login. Although if you look on the top line here, you can see it's login.mcrsft. So if you're looking at it really quick, you might think, oh, that looks like Microsoft and just start entering in your credentials. And basically you would be giving your credentials over to a hacker. Um, Another uh, recent one that we're seeing, hey, your password's changed. And you might be thinking, what? I didn't change my password. So if this wasn't you, follow these steps and they're going to give you links to click on to go in and investigate the problem, uh, which is, again, <laughs> going to lead you to a bad place. Now, business email compromise that I had brought it up before, it's basically where an attacker targets a business to defraud the company. So they first need to infiltrate. I mean, they can do it by spoofing. But a lot of what we see lately, the successful ones, they actually get trick somebody into giving up their credentials, hack someone's in the company's email account, and then they're able to send legitimate emails that looks like it's legitimately coming from a particular user. Um, so, and CEO fraud, whaling, this, is, this generally comes out of business email compromise where they're going to target the CEO if they, boy, if they can get the CEO uh, uh, access to the CEO's email, now they can send that to the finance department that says, hey, I need to wire funds, transfer funds. I'll say it once and I'm gonna say it again because we've seen it happen just too often. If your business and you're a finance person in your business, you need to have a process in place for wire transfers. Um, because is somebody, if you're sending a wire transfer, somebody's telling you to send a wire transfer, you have to be suspicious. You need to have a, a physical, <laughs> you know, low technology phone conversation with somebody just to confirm uh, if you are sending a wire transfer. We've seen it happen too many times where, uh, you know, an attacker just words an email to say, oh, I just left on vacation or, hey, do this real quick. I, I'm so late with this payment. Please do it ASAP. And people think, oh, my God, the boss told me I need to do this ASAP. I better do it. So if there's any doubt, pick up the phone to re-verify anything, even if it's not a payment. If it, somebody sends you a file and you're suspicious, call that person and say, hey, did you just send me a file? Just want to make sure. Um, yeah, I just talked about this. The account compromise is hacked. Your false invoice schemes. We've seen this quite often uh, where somebody, they do it via spoofing. They do it via taking over an account. They look and see what kind of payments that you make, what vendors that you work with, and they'll send you fake invoices and give you payment instructions uh, that's going to send it to the hacker and not to your vendor. Those things also need to be 
uh, looked at closely. So Mike, with business- to add, sometimes those uh, invoices aren't fake. It's just that the account information where you need to send the money, they that's just change right. that. And exactly. they make it such that the actual company doesn't get the email, the one that's compromised. Yeah. And they just give you new account information. So that's something that's really important. If somebody's asking you to change account information, it should yeah. be over email, it should be over the phone, somebody verifying that, yes, for this, this, and this reason, I need you to change my account yeah. information where you send the money. 100%. So when it comes to business email compromise, you know, watching out any high level executives asking for unusual information, request not to communicate with others. Hey, let's just keep that between me and you. Uh, request to bypass normal channels and then looking for language, which as we mentioned before with the use of AI is less common now. Uh, and then email domains or reply to addresses that don't match the sender's addresses 100%. You have to look for those things. Couple quick examples. Hey, I need you to make a wire transfer ASAP, definitely suspicious. The ones that you know somebody is watching and knows that an exec is going on vacation, maybe they send an e a test email to see and they get an out of office reply. And now they're gonna send a spoofed email that says, hey, I just left for vacation, but can you do this real quick? Um, forwarding your you know, WhatsApp cell number, kind of taking you out of the context of normal business communications into something else that the hacker can control. Again, being very suspicious of that as well. So um, when it comes to what you should be looking for in emails, you know, checking the address line, is it to you, is it blank, is it a long list of names, checking the sender's email address and the display name and checking the full display and looking for that legitimate email address that it's coming to make sure it matches, checking the subject line, does it look suspicious? Every, anytime you get emailed an attachment, you have to, you know, uh, be very, very suspicious of those. Also, don't be fooled by the use of official logos. That's what uh, hackers do to try and make things look legitimate. Looking at the greeting, is it really generic? You know, does it say, you know, greetings of the day or something unusual like that, that, you know, my, <laughs> is, isn't typical? Um and then a sense of urgency. Hey, I need you to do this right away. Or yeah, I just left on vacation. Can you do this real quick? Checking the body, looking for bad grammar. Uh, and then, you know, generic or suspicious email signatures, you know, the Microsoft team, your IT department, you know, basic things like that. And then if there is a link in there, definitely hovering over it to check the actual address first. You know, there are tools that you know, we certainly implement for our clients that protect links like this. But if you don't have something like that, you have to, you know, tr try and look at it as close as you can yourself. But if every anything looks suspicious, just delete the email, uh, call the person, whatever you need to do. Um, so just wanted to show you also just an example of a, a smishing scam. This is, an, again, an actual one sent to me. Uh, your your Amazon subscription has been blocked. You know, click here. Got to be suspicious of all those. So let's look at some safety tips. Definitely, when it comes to social media oversharing, this is where hackers lurk. If they are doing some sort of spear phishing and trying to gain intel on you, social media is a great place to do it. So think before you're sharing information. Passwords, you know, never reuse passwords. I know Rishwan went over some things, but using the same passwords over and over again, especially personal and business, that is uh, definitely a no-no. Always be skeptical. People shouldn't be falling for scams where, you know, they're expected to go out and, and pay for something with gift cards. Um, that's got to be super suspicious for anybody. Smishing, you know, watching out for your text messages. Yeah, your bank is never going to ask you to access your accounts from an SMS text. Avoid public Wi-Fi. If you do use it, just make sure you're conscious of what you're using it for, what information is passing over. Like if you're just doing some quick looks at a website, that's fine. But, you know, conducting business, definitely not. Uh, changing the default password on your home Wi-Fi if you can. Lots of people are working from home these days. 
uh, that's definitely a way that a hacker can get in and lurk around your home network. And if you are conducting business on your home network, again, you just have now we have to be uh, vigilant, not only in the office, but also at home as well. And then some other just general safety tips, you know, not clicking on any ads or links that seem fishy, only interacting with well-known sites, uh, confirming you're using non-fraudulent sites by checking the address line, looking for that, you know, safety lock, also just checking the address of the site that you're on or going to, certainly being very cautious with any kind of downloads that you're making from an online source, and never clicking on links within an email, you know, if you can always go directly to the website, especially when it comes to banking or any other kind of uh, places where you would go with sensitive information. And now I know this is, you know, general awareness training, but, um, you know, if you are the person that is responsible for managing IT and managing security for your business, you should be using some sort of a more advanced managed either EDR, MDR, XDR type of antivirus. They're just the more modern uh, antivirus that both protect and try and block viruses from coming in, but also have the means of seeing if something has got past your initial defenses. As we kind of pulled for at the beginning, making sure you have a regular awareness training program. We do that for all of our clients, but it has to be regular and you have to test your users as well. Vulnerability assessments of your environment regularly, encrypting laptops, making sure you have multi-factor authentication for any outside access of business systems, um, geo-blocking, gosh, uh, the amount of companies that we come into that we see that don't have geo-blocking, it's an easy way, an easy setting that can be changed. Again, not every IT company does that or internal IT people you know, know to do this for you. Uh, so ask your IT people if they're doing this for you. And then, you know, probably a more modern solution using a 24 seven security operations service uh, that's going to be monitoring events going on within your network environment. You know, there's a cost associated to that, but it is a next level, uh, next level step in protection for your business. So super quick, just some resources. I always like to use um, the government's uh, website because I mean, a lot of cybersecurity companies, you know, they're all trying to sell you their software or their solutions and things like that. The government I think is just legitimately trying to keep people and businesses safe. So I think this is a real good one to go for. They have lots of, you know, templates and resources and even videos and things like that on staying safe. And then you can always use our site as well. Again, go to our media dropdown, either look through our blogs. We have a lot of content on our blogs. We have a lot of these training videos that we've used as well. So uh, with that said, we've kind of gone through everything and we're just gonna open up some things now for Q&A. Tyler, anything come through for questions or anything in the chat? Nope, nothing there. Obviously we are are either really, really good or <laughs> everybody already knew everything to begin with. Hopefully that's the case. That would be um, our 100% desired goal is that when we went through all this concept, all these concepts, everybody's like, yeah, I know that top of mind. I'm always looking for this. I see that all the time and I avoid it like the plague. Those are the kind of comments that we would love to see. But um Assuming we don't have any uh, questions, we could just end off things there. And of course, as we always say to people, you can always uh, get through to us. Um, just email us inquiries at pacetechnical.com. If any questions come up, any concerns come up, if you'd like a private consultation, if you have any concerns about what's being done or potentially not being done to protect your own business and maybe want an opinion, you know, with a simple conversation, we can ask you some questions and and kind of get to the root of, are you doing the right things? Are you not doing the right things? Is there any, uh, you know, potential areas where you're out of alignment with cybersecurity? 
We can help you with all of those things. Maybe even give you some things to go back to your IT department and or your outsourced IT vendor to, to help shore some things up. Quick question that did come in, Mike. So we've got one that uh, someone looked at my LinkedIn and started emailing them my contacts, contacts asking for favors. One was to go and buy a gift card. Uh, I don't know how they could use my email address without hacking it. So, yeah, so this one. is something that comes into the uh, realm of spoofing, uh, where you don't actually, they're not actually using your email. They're just making the other person think like it's coming from you. Uh, that's the part that uh, Mike was also talking about. It, they probably did not get, get into your email. They just created an email that looked like it's coming from you. And all mm -hmm. they need for that person to do is uh, send a gift card to a certain location or call a certain number uh, or send Bitcoin, whatever it is. These are these are channels or and avenues where you don't even have to reply to an email. Yeah. Uh, if if again, like Mike said, if they do need a reply, if you probably reply back to it, it, it won't be going to your email address. It'll be going to some some other place, right? So yeah. it was it's not it, like they got ac access to your email. It's just uh, just like we we're talking about. It could be from somebody else. They just created a Gmail address that looked similar yeah. to yours. Or you know, if your company had a very generic domain and they were able to register something very similar to it, yeah, uh, they might it might be off for a few letters. And There's so many things that do it. So many different ways. Like almost anybody can get anybody else's email address very easily. Like if you were to Google it, um, you can find tools. There's even add-ins to like Google Chrome that will help you. Uh, find the email of anybody in the world. You just have to type in their name if you know what their company is. So they they do it a few different ways. They look at the format of known email addresses for your particular business, and they can sort of guess. If they know the format and they know what your name is, they can probably guess what your email address is going to be. Another way that hackers get is by hacking other people's systems that may have you in their contacts list. And now they have a whole plethora of uh, email addresses with contact names and things like that. So, and like Rishwan said, there's you know lots of ways they can manipulate you into thinking that uh, they were you know sending to you or got into your email or got into somebody else's email account or whatnot. So. It's very tricky, of course, but they're very good at it, and they're very good at tricking people into thinking that these things are legitimate. <clears throat> but asking for gift cards, that's <laughs> hopefully a red flag to everybody. <laughs> All right. Is that it? Anything else, Tyler? That's it. All right. We're good. So with that, we will end it off. Hope everybody has a great rest of the day and hope everybody stays safe out there in on the interweb and uh, look out for our next uh, we do these training webinars regularly we'll probably have another one coming up next month so look out for that and uh, wishing everybody all the best